The Anglo-Saxon period in English history is often underappreciated in historical narratives. And although it's been getting more attention lately, this has mostly been during the Viking Age and later. The reigns of Alfred the Great and his successors often overshadow those of earlier rulers, and Wessex especially gets focused on largely because the kings of Wessex will eventually become the kings of England, but this comes at the expense of the other kingdoms in the Anglo-Saxon period. But centuries before Alfred and the dominance of Wessex, there were other kingdoms in England which were much more prominent, including Mercia. And the dominance of Mercia seems to have begun with one of its most interesting kings, and one of the most interesting of all the Anglo-Saxon kings, the last king to have lived his entire life as a pagan, Penda of Mercia. One of the reasons why we don't hear about Mercia as much is because of the nature of our sources, especially early on. Unlike Wessex or Northumbria, we don't have a Mercian chronicle, and most of our information about it comes from outside. Much of our information in general about early Anglo-Saxon history comes from the Northumbrian monk Bede, and he seems to have had a bit of an anti-Mercian bias. And he's especially biased against Penda because Penda was a pagan. He fought and defeated several Christian kings, and he's even the main antagonist in the narrative of the martyrdom of the Saint King Oswald, but we'll get back to that later. The rest of our information comes largely from archaeology, and although archaeology has a reputation for being more truthful and less biased than written sources, we have to keep in mind that most of our conclusions about archaeology are based on interpretation, and that interpretation itself can be biased. There's also the matter of our archaeological sources being skewed in one way or another for a variety of reasons. I'm going to do my best in this video to present an accurate and scholarly interpretation based on the opinions of experts, as well as my own expertise as a medievalist focused on the early Middle Ages. But just keep this in mind during the video. Even scholars don't always agree on this stuff. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's take a look at Penda. Penda came from a royal lineage called the Itchlings, tracing its origins back to a man named Itchel. We don't know when the Itchlings became the kings of Mercia. They might have founded it, or maybe not. In fact, we don't know much about Mercian kings before Penda. Bede only mentions one king coming before him. It's probably safe to assume, however, that Itchel was the first of the line to arrive in Britain, and because of this, his descendants saw him as a dynastic founder. Based on the 8th century genealogy of Mercian kings, and the number of generations between Penda and Itchel, we can approximate Itchel's flourishing as being sometime between 450 and 525. As for Penda himself, he was likely born sometime around 605. We don't have a solid date for his birth, but we do know that he died in 655, and he was probably around 50. The only source that tells us his age is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which actually says he came to power at 50 in the year 626, but for a variety of reasons, most scholars agree that this was either a mistake or poor wording, and that the source the chronicler got this from actually states that 50 was his age at the end of his rule, not the beginning. I'm not going to go into too much detail as to why this is, but the reasons include the ages of his children, and also the fact that it seems unlikely that he would have been riding confidently into battle at 80 years old. In any case, the date he came to power is also uncertain, since we have three different sources saying different things. Aside from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which has him reigning 30 years, there's Bede, who has him reigning 22 years, and the Welsh Historia Britonum, which has him rule for 10 years after the death of his brother Eowa, whose reign isn't actually mentioned anywhere else. There have been a couple of attempts to reconcile these dates, but I personally think Nicholas Brooks's explanation is the most likely, in that Penda did come to power in some regard in 626, but his actual power over his realm ebbed and flowed several times before he finally established himself firmly in the last 10 to 13 years of his reign. Both of the later dates correspond to important events in Penda's life, events which would have strengthened his support base and could have been seen, especially as outsiders, as the start of his reign. Bede's 22 years would have Penda's reign start after the Battle of Hatfield in 633. Up until this time, King Edwin of Northumbria was extremely powerful, and held dominion over large parts of Britain beyond his own kingdom, including Mercia and Wales. In 633, however, the Welsh king Cadwallon of Gwynedd marched against Edwin in order to end his hegemony, and Penda joined him as an ally. 
The campaign ended with Edwin's death and his villa and a church being burned down by pagans, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which might have been Penda and his men. Even though Penda wasn't the leader of this campaign, his military success would have garnered him support amongst the Mercian nobility if he'd been struggling to hold on to power up to that point, and Bede notes that his reign had varying success. The Historia Britonum's date corresponds more closely with the Battle of Maserfield, sometime around 642. By this point, Cadwallon had died in battle against Edwin's successor, Oswald, which might have weakened Penda's position once again. However, at Maserfield, Penda defeated Oswald, who would from then on be revered as a saint, and Penda finally established himself as a dominant king and seems to have held this place for the rest of his reign. This was also likely connected to the death of his brother Eowa at Maserfield, who, like I said before, is only mentioned in the Historia Britonum. This single mention makes it difficult to know the nature of the relationship between the two, but I again find Nicholas Brooks's argument most compelling. Brooks suggests that Penda and Eowa competed over royal power in Mercia, and they'd been doing so since 626. Eowa might have been a supporter of Northumbrian hegemony, and he might have relied on his relationship to the Northumbrian kings to hold on to power in Mercia, something which wasn't at all uncommon amongst relatives competing for the throne. Penda, on the other hand, might have rebelled against this hegemony in order to get an edge over his brother. Brooks even points out that although the Historia Britonum says Eowa died at Maserfield, it never specifies which side he was on, and he might have been fighting alongside Oswald rather than his brother. But even if Eowa didn't fight alongside Oswald, and even if he didn't support Northumbrian hegemony, Anglo-Saxon nobility was a military aristocracy, and victories like this would have supported Penda and allowed him potentially to eclipse his brother, although he might have faltered a little bit after the death of his biggest ally, Cadwallon. And even if there was little competition between the brothers and they largely worked together with distinct spheres within the kingdom, which has also been suggested, though I personally find it less convincing, even if this was the case, Eowa's death would have removed Penda's biggest obstacle to having dominance over Mercia, and his major victory would have certainly raised his support. After Maserfield, Penda would grow to become the most powerful king in all of Britain, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. However, his success ended in 655 when he was defeated by Oswald's brother Oswiu at the Battle of Winwade, where Penda lost his life. As I'm sure you've gathered by now, kings dying in battle at this time was not all that uncommon, since they tended to lead their armies directly. So that's the man by and large. Again, we don't get a whole lot of personal details about Penda's life because we only get hints of it from outside sources. But to get a better understanding of Penda's place in Britain at the time, we have to take a closer look at his kingdom itself. It's hard to say exactly where the limits of Mercia were in the 7th century, since borders weren't firm and various rulers often claimed the same frontiers. This was true throughout the Middle Ages and well into the early modern period as well, and it's why I never draw clearly defined borders on my maps. That being said, if we were to map the Kingdom of Mercia, it would probably look something like this. But even looking at this map is slightly misleading, or at least it doesn't give the whole picture. It's likely that the core of Mercia's territory, that is, the area over which Penda would have had the most power, was the Trent Valley. It's likely that this was the original Mercia, or Mercia in Old English, that is, what we would call a march, or frontier, in this case, against the Brythonic lands to the west. Other parts of the kingdom would have been controlled by the various nobles or thanes who held lands there, and the relationship and support for the king could vary especially for those further out on the frontier, whose loyalty might switch from one kingdom to another, assuming they had any loyalties at all. Early Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were not bureaucratic institutions, especially before Christianity. The rulership and kingship was based on personal ties between a king and his subordinates. There was a lot of ritual pertaining to the king meeting the nobles of his realm, either traveling around to visit them at their own courts, or having them come to visit him. There were swearing of oaths, making promises, and exchanging gifts. There's a reason why in the epic poem Beowulf, kings are often referred to as ring-givers, in allusion to this gift-giving which was so important to kingship at the time. Likewise, as I mentioned earlier, Anglo-Saxon society was militaristic, and so a king could ensure support and loyalty by leading his thanes on successful military campaigns, especially when he could extract loot or tribute from his enemies and gift it to his followers. 
Both the victories and the loot proved to the other powerful men of the kingdom that the king was worthy of ruling. And again, as I've mentioned already, this was likely key in establishing and stabilizing Penda's rule over Mercia in the first 18 or so years of his reign. But of course, a rule supported by personal relationships is limited by how many personal relationships you can support. Penda seems to have been aware of this, and so he created sub-kingdoms on the frontiers of his realm in order to consolidate his power there by installing a king with whom he had a strong relationship. One of these was the kingdom of the Middle Angles, which he gave to his son and heir, Peda. Another was the kingdom of what would later be called the Magansat, around Hereford. Here he installed a man named Merowal. According to the hagiographer Goslin, Merowal, who was the father of St. Milberg, which is why he brings this up, was another son of Penda, but in reality he might have actually been his son-in-law, which to be honest is an understandable mistake for someone writing about the lives of people who lived 400 years before his own. But the reason I bring this up is because Merowal's ethnicity might actually tell us something quite interesting about Penda's realm. You see, there's a fair bit of evidence to say that the people later known as the Magonsata were, during Penda's time, largely Britons, rather than Anglo-Saxons. That is, Celtic-speaking natives of the island of Britain, like the Welsh, rather than Germanic Old English-speaking descendants of Anglo-Saxons and others who migrated to Britain from the continent, like Penda's ancestor Itchel. Now, these days, scholars largely agree that the traditional narrative of Anglo-Saxons completely wiping out the Britons and replacing them is wrong. Instead, they likely ruled over Brythonic populations, who over time assimilated into Anglo-Saxon culture and took on Anglo-Saxon identities. If you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend looking for the videos on the topic by the channel Cambrian Chronicles. He does a good job at going over this, and he does the topic justice, I think. Now, it's definitely possible that during Penda's time, there were Britons in various parts of Mercia, though in the core areas, they would have been more likely to have assimilated more quickly. However, most of Mercia would have invariably been dominated by an Anglo-Saxon nobility, with any Britons being free or semi-free peasants or slaves. The lands of the Magonsata, on the other hand, as well as that of the Reokonsata north of it, and possibly even the kingdom of Huiche further south, could have had a Brythonic presence among the nobility. This assumption is based on a couple of pieces of evidence. First of all, they have few Anglo-Saxon-style furnished burials, with Huiche having the most, but even here they're mostly on the frontier. Anglo-Saxon nobility continued to be buried with lots of grave goods well into the 8th century, even after converting to Christianity so it's likely that there were few of them in these parts at the time. Even if they all quickly converted to Christianity in these areas, which already seems like a stretch, it's unlikely that they would have abandoned the practice of furnished burials so suddenly. There's also evidence based on place names, with few pagan place names in these parts in contrast to the Trent Valley. There's also more towns with names like Eccleston or Exhall, or other names starting with Eccles, which is Latin for church, and comes into Welsh as Egles. And which likely means that there were significant Brythonic churches there when the Anglo-Saxons gave these towns their Old English names. In some cases, it could have been a prominent ruin, but in others, it might have been functioning, and there is some archaeological evidence for later Anglo-Saxon churches being built in the same space and with the same orientation as older Brythonic foundations, which implies that the church was in use at least until the Mercians converted in the time of Penda's successors. There's also some literary evidence which could suggest bishops working in these areas, including Bede's narrative which states that the missionary bishop Augustine of Canterbury held a council with several Brythonic bishops on the border between Wessex and Huicha in the early 7th century, which the historian Damien Tyler suggests implied that the Britons attending, or at least some of them, may have been from Huicha. If you're wondering what Brythonic churches and bishops has to do with nobility, keep in mind that medieval churches were major landholders, and often held great amounts of local power. In the early Middle Ages especially, bishops were often equivalent to someone like a thane, and could even go to battle if need be. They also often relied on the support of local aristocracies, and noble families often patronized them and tried to get members of their own families to obtain the office of bishop, as happened with figures like Gregory of Tours in 6th century Gaul who came from a traditional Gallo-Roman senatorial family, and he was far from the exception in this. Obviously, none of this is 100% certain, and all of this evidence could potentially be explained away in other ways. However, when taken together, it certainly creates a fairly compelling argument that at least some of the nobility in the westernmost parts of Mercia were 
Britonic Christians. And coming back then to Merowal, if he was in fact Penda's son-in-law rather than his actual son, it's certainly possible that he was a Briton rather than an Anglo-Saxon, possibly from a local elite family who managed to impress Penda with his prowess, and who Penda then decided to place as sub-king over this region and offered the hand of one of his daughters in order to secure Merowal's loyalty. This would certainly explain the man's name, which literally translates to illustrious Welshman, and it might have been an English nickname rather than his birth name. Another way Penda might have consolidated his authority over his kingdom was through religion. Unfortunately, however, we know next to nothing about this, or even really about Anglo-Saxon paganism more generally. Most people who make claims about it are doing so based on speculation. Most of what we do know about the relationships between Anglo-Saxon kings and their religion concerns Christians, and this largely meant supporting the growth of the church, and in the case of the kings of Kent, ensuring that English churches recognized the authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury, or that of York in the case of Northumbria. But how paganism tied into kingship, and more specifically how Penda might have used it, is largely a mystery. By the end of his reign, Penda was surrounded by Christian kingdoms, which has led some to wonder why he didn't himself convert. Of course, there are just as many possible reasons for him not to convert as there would be for him to do so, and he might not have even considered it. The so-called triumph of Christianity presented by Bede was not an inevitability. Though, based on how widespread it became, conversion was likely to have crossed Penda's mind at some point. One of the biggest factors in him not doing so, however, was likely the fact that he had so many military successes, especially against several Christian rivals, which probably convinced him that his gods supported him while Christ was unable to protect his enemies. But there may have been a connection to the way he saw kingship as well. Unlike in Wales or Ireland, where you have dozens of kings of various degrees with over kings and even sub kings who ruled over tiny kingdoms, Anglo Saxons tended to be more restrictive with the way they understood kingship, giving different titles to those beneath them, like alderman or thane. By the 8th century, there's a clear sense of a royal class, people sharing descent with those eligible to be kings, like the Itchlings, for example, and high and illustrious positions are reserved for the king's close relatives. At the same time, you get genealogies which serve to illustrate the illustrious nature of these royal lines. And one thing that these lineages have in common is that they often connect the line to Woden, the pagan king of the gods. Now, in the Christian context, this still makes sense, because it was a fairly standard idea by then that pagan gods had once been real people, sometimes great people, who had come to be falsely worshipped at the advice of demons. But... If the idea that kings were descendants of Woden predates Christianity, pagan kings might have tied their right to rule to a divine lineage, something Penda himself may have played heavily upon, which, if that were the case, would definitely make conversion problematic. But of course, this is all speculative. We don't actually know when the idea of kings being descendants of Woden arose, and certainly the fact that Penda created a bunch of sub-kingdoms does lessen the chances that kingship in Mercia at the time had the same status as it would later on, although admittedly the kings that he placed in these realms were related to him in some degree. Or he might have supported his kingship religiously in other ways, or even not at all. Again, we don't really know, and since most of our sources are Christian, they don't really have any interest in discussing this sort of thing. They might not even have much knowledge of it. But Penda's dominion was not limited to the confines of his kingdom whatever those might have been. He seems to have been one of several kings who, in the words of Bede, held imperium over much of Britain. Bede himself doesn't include him in his list, but there's plenty of evidence that Penda was very powerful, and Bede's omission is likely because he didn't like him. Penda's victories in battle wouldn't have only impressed those within Mercia. A major victory for a king could also project his power beyond his borders. In the narrative of Penda's final battle in 655, we hear that he had several other rulers who joined him. His relationship with the Welsh kingdoms seems to have remained strong, and his victory over Oswald may have been seen as vengeance for Cadwallon of Gwynedd, which appears to have tied some Welsh kings closely to him. There's mention of several of them fighting alongside Penda, and we know for sure that Cataphile, Cadwallon's successor to the throne of Gwynedd, was an ally and joined Penda on his final campaign though he didn't join the battle, which might have cost Penda his victory, or possibly just saved Cataphile's life. 
Based on later Welsh poetry, it's also possible that Cynvillan of Powys also joined Penda against Oswald at Maserfield or Oswio at Winwood, or both. Penda doesn't seem to have ever fought against any Welsh rulers, so they likely came of their own accord. But Imperium could also be established through active political maneuvering as well. I've already mentioned the Kingdom of Hwitsha, and this was a minor kingdom, possibly even originally just a territory without a king, which had historical ties to Yewissa, later Wessex. However, after Penda fought a battle against King Cunigils of Wessex in 628, Hwitsha came under Mercian control as a subkingdom. Its relationship with Mercia was exceptionally close, and it would eventually be absorbed into it a century later, which is why I've depicted it as being part of Mercia. Though most of Mercia's imperium did not give Penda anywhere near as strong a hold. In fact, it's possible that Penda saw Hwitsha as Mercian frontier land all along, much like the land of the Middle Angles. Again, these things weren't strongly defined. Penda probably also had some hold over Wessex as well, for a time anyway. Wessex was one of the least centralized kingdoms at the time, with lots of competition for power. Kenwall, the son of Cunegils, eventually became king and he was married to one of Penda's daughters, which might indicate that he rose to power with Penda's help, in exchange for a degree of fealty to his father-in-law, much like what might have been the case between Penda's brother Eowa and the Northumbrians. In any case, Penda certainly held power over Wessex after Kenwell set his daughter aside in order to remarry, after which Penda invaded and forced the king into exile at the court of Anna of East Anglia for three years. It's very possible that Kenwell set Penda's daughter aside in order to exert his independence from Mercia, but if this was the case, it definitely backfired. Speaking of East Anglia, Penda used military might to assert himself here as well. He frequently fought against King Anna for control over their shared frontier, and this ended with Anna's death in 654. Anna was succeeded by his brother Athelhera, who fought and died alongside Penda the following year, which in turn strongly implies that he rose to the throne with either Penda's help or at least his permission, and therefore fell under his imperium. Less certainly, there's Daira and Lindsay. After Oswald's death, Northumbria had been split again into the two historical kingdoms of Daira in the south and Bernicia in the north. Bernicia was ruled by Oswiu, the guy who would eventually defeat Penda, and it was frequently raided by Penda, which was the reason for their eventual war. But in order to conduct those raids, Penda would have had to pass through Daira, and yet we never hear about any conflicts there. This might mean that Oswina, who ruled Daira until 651, could have been loyal to Penda, especially since, unlike Oswiu, and despite what the similarities of their names might suggest, Oswina was not a brother of Oswald, and may owe his ascension to Penda. This certainly adds some light to Oswiu's decision to attack Oswina, which led to Oswina's murder. What's especially interesting is that Oswina was then replaced by Athelwald, Oswald's son and Oswiu's nephew, but this might still have been helped by Penda since Athelwold was in Penda's army in 655, though he didn't join in the battle. As for Lindsay, it was a minor kingdom, which by this time was pretty much always dominated by one of its neighbours. There's no telling whether it accepted Mercian hegemony during Penda's reign, but Damien Tyler suggests that it could have since it had previously submitted to Northumbria under Edwin, and by the end of Penda's rule, he seems to have held Imperium over both of Lindsay's other more powerful neighbours. So, in the end, although some of the chronology, especially in Wessex, is not totally certain, the extent of Mercia's power by the end of Penda's reign seems to have looked something like this. There is little doubt that Penda was certainly one of the most powerful rulers in Britain by the time of his death. But after Penda's death, much of this Imperium would have fallen with him although his successors did manage to reassert some of it for themselves, and Mercia remained one of the most powerful kingdoms. But still, it wasn't inherited directly to his heirs. And this is an important thing to keep in mind when talking about overlordship, and especially Anglo-Saxon Imperium. I'm going to make a whole video delving deeper into this topic in the future, but basically, this was very much both a personal relationship, bound to Penta himself and not Mercia as a whole, with Hwitsha being the possible exception, as well as being an informal one. I mean, there were rituals and oaths tying these relationships together, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't annexation and there was little centralization. This was one king positioning himself so that another would recognize his power and authority, would join him in battle and avoid going to battle against him, 
And people in these positions jockeyed for control or better relationships. Like I pointed out with Kenwall divorcing Penda's daughter, likely feeling that he could do so because his power had grown enough to change the dynamic between himself and his neighbor. These weren't formal offices and positions. They were fluid and blurry, and terms like imperium were only applied in hindsight. Like I said, I am working on another video that's going to go into this concept with a lot more depth. But for now, I hope you've enjoyed this brief look at this elusive but very interesting early English king. I always love looking into these lesser known bits of history and taking a deep dive into them. And honestly, any topic that lets me reread Bede is one that I'm very happy to look into. In any case, I'll see you next time. Thank you.